My name is Remy Schultz, and I'm the registrar at the Crested Butte Museum. Thank you so much for joining our eighth installment of the Crested Butte History at Home series. It's our last installment, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to start the evening by giving a land acknowledgement. The museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land, which is historically Ute territory. We acknowledge that the Incompadre Ute and the Tapawash Ute were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruno Treaty. We hope that you will take the time to visit our neighbor, the Ute Museum, located in Montrose, Colorado. Uh, while we can never do this history justice, we do include information <clears throat> about Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruno Treaty, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. Other ways to support Indigenous peoples of today and the past is to go beyond land acknowledgements. So please consider taking steps towards allyship and reconciliation by conducting your own research of Indigenous groups that were forcibly removed from your own community, visiting local Indigenous museums and cultural centers, and reading literature from Indigenous writers. We hope that you will consider becoming members of the museum or making a donation to support this program and all the work we do here at the museum. And you can do that by visiting our website at crestabutemuseum.com. Uh, the museum is currently open from 11 to 5 during the week and 11 to 6 on weekends. We have several events coming up. Please join us every Friday at 10 a.m. at the museum for a 45-minute interpretive tour inside the museum. You can learn about Tony's Conoco, old timers, and an in-depth look into our current exhibits. Uh, please join us for our CB walking tours every Wednesday at 2 p.m. with Glow Cunningham. The museum will be closed April 10th to May 20th. However, we do have our May 18th melting pot cook-off event. So come see us there. And we also have a June 26th black and white ball, which is a ton of fun. <laughs> this program is being recorded and will be available at crestabutemuseum.com and on our YouTube page within. If you have any questions about our programming, visit crestabutemuseum.com, find us on Facebook or Instagram, or sign up for our newsletter. We also will always list our events in the newspaper. Um, at the end of tonight's session, we will have time for questions at the end of the talk. So please post those in the chat or the Q&A. We also have a trivia question. Is that right? Yep. Great. You can post your answer to the trivia question in the chat box or the Q&A, and I will grab your name and number for a prize. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, did, did you want to? Oh, I want to say thank you to uh, everyone who attended and to our lead sponsors, Diane Woolery, in honor of John Yankovich, John Bricker's Construction, and Coach Evers. Without our sponsors, we cannot provide the series and your generous donations. Okay, thank you very much, Remy. Uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to do, folks, this will be our last podcast now with uh, hopefully more to follow in the fall. But I want to thank uh, all the people at the museum who have been uh, so generous with me, Belinda, Anne Marie, Ashley, Gina, and of course, Remy here have done a great job. And a great uh, shout out to the three sponsors. We really appreciate them. We really appreciate all of you people being on board. We've had a lot of uh, people who have been real regular. I uh, also want to say that our last uh, topic tonight is going to be one that's near and dear to my heart, and those are the ethnic peoples of Crested Butte. Um, we just got finished with a, a quite a week last week, the end of the ski season, Flouching, uh, Pete Dunda playing at a roaring polka party at Cochever's, uh, a pub crawl. Uh, Pete had one of the biggest crowds I've ever seen for Flouching, and uh, it was really a lot of fun. So here we go. We're going to talk about the immigrants of Crested Butte, the ethnic people of Crested Butte. And I want to start off with a little personal statement here. Uh, my grandfather and father were both born in Belgium. And uh, my grandfather came over here in 1919. And my father, the following year, with my grandmother and two aunts, uh, his two sisters, in 1920. Uh, so I grew up in a Belgian farming community on the north end of Lake Michigan, in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And the name of the farming community was called St. Nicholas. So every Christmas, uh, I'm kind of in vogue. And everybody talked either in a foreign language, Flemish, Walloon, or Dutch, and, uh, or spoken a clipped accent as they learned English. So I think I've told this story when I first came here on or about Labor Day in 1962. I came up to Crested Butte to see the town and maybe meet some people, have a glass of beer. And everybody I met was either talking in a foreign language or a clipped accent. And I just said to myself, Vanden Bush, you are home. And all of those people had strange sounding names like they had in my Belgian farming community. 
Panyan and Krizmanich and Mihalich and Saya and Sedmak and Malensik and Spritzer and so on. And they were all descendants of immigrants and some had been immigrants who came over. So immigration is the oldest and most persistent theme in American history. And the United States with the Statue of Liberty became the melting pot of nations. And I'm gonna read the phrase that's on the Statue of Liberty. I'd like to start off by, by saying that. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea wash sunset gates will stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command. The air bridge harbor that twin cities frame, keep ancient lands your storied prompt, pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And my father was 10 when he came over and he always told me about what an emotional thing that was to see the Statue of Liberty. Because they came from the old country and now they had a new opportunity. Immigrants came to the United States and Crested Butte for a variety of reasons. Foreign war, hard times, class system they never could rise out of and hope. From 1865, <clears throat> excuse me, to 1900, 33 million immigrants came to the United States. That's about a million a year. They made many contributions and the United States became a nation of immigrants and a melting pot. And the same thing for Crested Butte. The immigrants did the back baking, breaking work that others didn't want to do, like working in coal mines. They made the U.S. the richest culture in the world, the melting pot of nations. They increased our population and settled wilderness areas that no one else wanted to go into. Now, we had two types of immigration. The old immigration came from Northwestern Europe. Those are the first immigrants who came to the U.S. And they came from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Scandinavia. They were what I call wasps, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestants. They were called Cousin Jacks and Cousin Jennies in Crested Butte. They were Protestant and they spoke the English language. Many of these people went into farming around the Great Lakes in the Midwest. Others became some of the best hard rock miners in the world, as they had been in Wales in particular. The new immigration came later starting in the 1880s, picking up in the 1890s. And they came from Southeastern Europe, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Italy, Yugoslavia, Slovenia, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. There are more Polish people living in Chicago today than any city in Poland. There are more Jewish people living in New York City than in any city in the world, including Israel. The early view of immigrants was that they would conform to Anglo-Saxon patterns of behavior and be assimilated. In other words, they were expected to speak English and adopt U.S. customs. Now that unfortunately happened in my family because everybody wanted to be an American. And today we have a little different view because those people brought a lot to this country and uh, hopefully a lot of people today would keep the language that they were grew grown up in. Later views wanted immigrants to maintain their identities. Mary Anton, an immigrant said this, we came not empty handed here, but brought a rich inheritance. They brought their philology. Philology came from the Brothers Grimm, which wrote uh, Hansel and Gretel and children's tales in Germany. And philology means the folk spirit of a people, the language, the customs, the art, the traditions and the music and that contributed a lot to the United States. Some of the great immigrants who came to the U.S. were Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone, Joseph Pulitzer, we give out Pulitzer Prizes today, Nikola Tesla, who came up with alternating current electricity, Louis Agassiz, one of the great painters, John Peter Altgeld, who became the governor of Illinois, 
Jacob Reese, one of the muckrakers who wrote a great book about people in tenement houses in New York called How the Other Half Lives. Samuel Gompers, the head of the American Federation of Labor. Andrew Carnegie, the head of the Great Steel Company. And E.V. Rollbog, who later on, his family, one of his family became the governor of Minnesota. And Rollbog wrote one of the great works called Giants in the Earth. They were all immigrants who made great contributions. Very early, a great deal of resentment came to immigration. Labor opposed immigrants because of too many workers driving down wages. Social reformers opposed immigration because these people lived in slums, they had poor public health facilities, and they were exploited as poor illiterate immigrants. And these people thought you could never get rid of that unless you could get rid of the immigrants. And then finally, the people who opposed immigration were Nordic supremacists, the wasps, who thought they were better than those people who came from Southeastern Europe and who maybe were Catholic. The way to keep immigrants out of the United States was by passing literacy tests and establishing federal laws and quotas like the Immigration Acts of 1917 and 1924. And those quotas were designed to keep people out of, uh, that came from Southeastern Europe out of the country. So they had very few people that were allowed in and the people who were allowed to, uh, many to come in were those people who came from Northwestern Europe. The early foreigners who came to Crested Butte were from Canada. The great Al Johnson and his brother Fred, two examples. They came from Norway, Sweden, and from the British Isles. And a lot of the early names in Crested Butte had names like Ross and McNeil and Gardner and McCluskey. And most of those people were sprung from the reality of the British coal mines. In, in Wales, the tin mines had been open for seven centuries. And in Europe, their boys went into the mines at eight or nine years old. And many of them never lived to see the light of day. They went into the mines at dark. They came out of the mines at dark. They worked seven days a week and they were needed in the mines because they could get into the small seams of coal. So many of these kids died at 19 or 20 with coal dust in their veins, black lung, never having seen the light of day from the age of eight or nine to when they died. It was all in the dark. How Green Was My Valley is a great movie about the coal mines of Wales, a lot like Crested Butte. Large numbers of immigrants were attracted by the gold and silver mines in the US. Those were the cousin Jacks and cousin Jennies from Northwestern Europe. For the first 15 years, almost all of the early people of Crested Butte came from the British Isles, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and England. As the Denver Rio Grande laid tracks in the Black Canyon in 1881, Irish and Italian laborers were the workmen with not much light for each other. In October of that year, an Austrian worker, after not being paid on time and then being hit by his boss, shot the contractor in the breast with a pistol, killing him. He fled. But seven miles down the Black Canyon, he was caught by Gunnison Sheriff George Ewell and his deputies. The man was put in jail at four in the afternoon. But at midnight, 20 armed men who were masked took him from jail, dragged him to a livery stable on West Amici Avenue, where he was hung. None of the 10 men who got him out of there were ever found out. And if you go on the west side of Tamichi today, it's on, just on the west side of Taylor Street. It was hung at Crook's Livery Barn. All of the miners killed in the Jokerville mine explosion of 1884, 61 of them were from the British Isles. A few of the immigrants came from Austro the Austro-Hungarian Empire from 1880 to 85, but very few. Jake Kochever, Stephen Yelenic, John Pasek, Matt Malensic Sr., Joe Rosman, they were some of the people who came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In the 1800s, there were three empires in Europe and they were all going downhill because they had great ethnic divisions. One was the Austro-Hungarian Empire headquarters, Vienna. One was the Ottoman Turk Empire, headquarters Istanbul, and the other was the Russian Empire, headquarters in Moscow. Southeastern Europe is dominated by the Balkan Mountains and many different ethnic groups, each of whom live in a different valley. 
and traditionally they've hated each other. These are Slovenes, Slovaks, Czechs, Italians, Austrians, Bulgarians, etc. And they were divided because some were Muslim and some were Christian, and then some were Catholic and some were Protestant. All of those empires were fading badly by the year 1900. Lord Turgot, the French foreign minister, made a comment one time. Colonies, he said, are like fruit on a tree. When they get ripe, they drop off. And all of those people who had been part of colonies within those empires were starting to drop off. And Voltaire's famous comment, the comment was, nothing is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And the idea of freedom and the idea of liberty was strong in that area of the world. The Austro-Hungarian Empire had gotten started in 1273 with many leaders called Holy Roman Emperors. Napoleon made the famous comment, none of them were holy, none of them were Roman, and none of them were emperors. They began to accumulate territory through conquest, marriage, luck, and support from the Catholic Church. And that was the empire that most of the people from Crested Butte came from. All of those empires collapsed as a result of World War I, and three new countries were created as a result of the Treaty of Versailles ending the war. Czechoslovakia with the capital of Prague, Yugoslavia with the capital of Belgrade, and Poland with the capital of Warsaw. All of those people now were free and able to leave. All of the people that came from these three empires were poor agricultural people. They were mostly Catholic, and there are some of them living in what was Croatia at that time. And they were forced into the army of Austria, Turkey, or Russia. By the 1890s, they sought a better life. Many of them left their provincial agricultural villages where they had orchards and vineyards, and they came to the US. And they came through Ellis Island. Like my father and grandfather, they spoke no English. They didn't know very many people over here. Uh, they had a lot of courage as they came. My father and grandfather, I remember, very rarely referred to the country they had come from as, as Belgium. They always talked about the old country. And they left the old country for a good reason, and that was to come to the new country. Coming into Crested Butte now in the 1890s were Slovenes, Croatians, Italians, Austrians, mostly Slavic people. And there you can see some of them after a hunt in Crested Butte in the late, in the middle 1890s. They were completely ignorant of mining. And because they knew little about industrial jobs, they were considered stupid. The Slavs in Crested Butte kept to themselves early crowding into a good number of boarding houses. Many Slavic women ran them. Margaret Golovich always looked at a prospective boarder's hands before accepting them. If they weren't rough from work, the man was turned away. Many of those who came early were young and single men forced to leave family behind. Relaxation and companionship was found in the saloon. And there you see Rosiches. If you come to Crested Butte today, Rosich's is now the public house. And that was one of the big saloons. There, in the saloons, one could drown one's sorrows, overcome one's weariness from hard and long work in the mines, meet fellow people, could buy steamship tickets and money orders for folks in the old country. And a lot of them sent money back to the old country. They could play poker, they could eat, they could dance the polka, the shottish and the waltz. They could have one's letter written. They could enjoy meeting a girl, they su to subscribe to newspapers and they could pay their lodge and club dues. Many businessmen in Crested Butte and there was a great shot of Tony Danny, 1918 or 1917, carrying the newspaper from the News Depot in downtown Crested Butte. Later on, lived at Jack's cabin, became a county commissioner and a great friend of mine, passed away in 1975. Many businessmen in Crested Butte very early got their start by running that saloon. Martin Verju was the first Slav to own a store. 
He competed with seven others, including the Colorado Supply Store. That's the CF&I store. And he grossed $90,000 in 1926. Now, there you get a good shot of uh, John Rosman of the Rosman Ranch south of town and his wife, Mary Sedmack Rosman. Johnny Rosman, who runs that today, is the son of John Rosman. And this is another immigrant family that came over. John Rosich, another Slav, had Rosich's Bar, now the public house. He had come to Crested Butte at the age of 21 in 1886. Later on, he became a rancher and a businessman until he died in 1947. Very early, the Slavs were detested because they took jobs. They were Catholic. They spoke a different language. And they were very suspicious when World War I broke out. There you get a good shot of how musical these people were. That is Emil Spritzer in the 1930s in Crested Butte. And those people were great musicians. The immigrants who came over worked in the coal mines. And we've already talked about the nine coal mines around Crested Butte with the CF&I big mine on the bench being number one. Working in the coal mines was tough work and very dangerous. Some of these men worked on their knees to develop two foot high seams. It was damp, cold, water. In good conditions, a miner could shovel 30 tons of coal a day and he could make about three bucks a day. If you worked on the contract system and you were good enough, you might be able to make five to $6 a day. Periodic strikes hurt the immigrants. The first strike came in 1890 and led the Italian Council in Denver to ask the Elk Mountain pilot in Crested Butte to publish a telegram begging miners there to stop the strike against the CF&I and quote, trust in the justice of the authorities. Another strike came in 1903 when the United Mine Workers under John Mitchell called out 150,000 coal miners across the nation. This led George Bear, the head of the Reading Railroad and also a big mine owner to say this, quote, the rights and interests of the laboring men will be protected and cared for, not by the labor agitators, but by the Christian men to whom God in his infinite wisdom has given control of the property interests of this country. As if God was on the side of the big shots and not on the side of the little men. This led the great wit Peter Dunn, who wrote in the New York newspapers under the synonym of Mr. Dooley to reply, and I quote, what do you think of the man down in Pennsylvania, George Bear, who says the Lord and him is partners in a coal mine as he divided the profits? Distributed women who spoke no English learned to shout, go home scab at passing strike breakers. Sylvia Smith, the fiery editor of the Crested Butte Weekly Citizen in the early 1900s, wrote negatively about the Slavs. And she said this, a fracas occurred at the Croatian saloon Sunday night. A number of Emperor Joseph's former subjects got into a wholesale mix up in debating the work or no work idea. And the fighting host would have filled the trenches with corpses if the sheriff had not shown up. Paul Panyon Sr. in the year 1903 tried to rid the town of scabs gathered at the Croatian hall saloon. He lit the fuse to 12-6 of dynamite, but he was unable to get into the building. Instead, he threw the powder into the street, blowing a huge hole, but injuring no one. The Colorado Fuel and Iron Company had a company town in Crested Butte. Company store, you bought your goods there. Company housing, you lived there. Company playground, you played there. And company script, that's how you got paid off, not money. You could spend it in Crested Butte, but anywhere outside of town, it was worthless. They used to say that if a man died in the mine, all you had to do is give $10 to the flower fund. If a mule died, that cost $70. So a mule really was worth more than a man. To help immigrants in Crested Butte, fraternal societies were founded nationally and then spread to Crested Butte. They wanted to preserve the culture in the Catholic Church. The first fraternal order came in 1893, St. Joseph, founded by the Slovenes. Now there you see uh, mostly part of the Spritzers, 
And this is at a big picnic up Walrod Gulch in the 1960s. Eagles of the Plains was another one of those orders, as was the Society of St. Barbara. The Croatians started the Society of the Blessed Virgin Mary. All members of these societies paid dues, went to church, and helped out those in need. Marching on holidays or when a visiting dignitary came, the fraternal braids were very colorful. They had flags, and all members wore uniforms. The Catholic Church was very important and held dances to help pay for the new St. Patrick's Church, which today is on Maroon Street. The church, however, became overbearing. The priest demanded $10 fee for saying mass in town. It's kind of a tithe. Now, I reminisce a little bit about what happened in my Belgian farming community of St. Nicholas. We had a priest named Father Coignard who was from France who ruled with an iron fist. And where you sat in church was dictated by how much money you contributed per week. So if you contributed a lot, you were up in the front. If you contributed a little, you were out in the back. We were in the back on the right side. And Father Coignard had envelopes, and you had your name on the envelope, and you put money to support the church in the envelope. And then at the start of Mass, he would read off what everybody contributed. So he would say, Van Dam, one dot. One dot went one dollar. And of course, uh, if you paid one dollar and somebody paid 50 cents, uh, you didn't want to be considered a cheapskate. But that's the way it was at that time. Local people were bled white to contribute to state and national Catholic organizations. Anybody who was sick or getting aid from these fraternal organizations was not allowed to attend any entertainment or do physical labor, and certainly not be caught drinking. And there is a march of one of the fraternal orders right down Elk Avenue before the turn of the century. Steve Crisman is senior in 1914, set up a night school and taught English at St. Mary's Hall. St. Mary's bought the former Knights of Pythias Hall in 1902 for 1,750 bucks. It was located on Elk Avenue. The big metal clad building was jacked onto log rollers and then dragged backwards to its present location on 2nd Street. That move took a month with men working after their shifts or on weekends. Horses were used to help make that move. Preston Butte at its peak had eight fraternal organizations. When the big mine closed in 1952, the Croatian Hall was sold seven years later to Dr. Hubert Smith of Texas, who used it for his Law Science Academy. The four remaining lodges, St. Joseph, St. Mary, Plains Eagles, and Columbine, met in Frank Yelenik's home. He was an officer of each. As more people moved out of town, the lodges ceased to exist. The women of Crested Butte were great cooks with kabasi, which meant sausage. Hajma, soup and stew, Povitika, nut bread, and Potica, which I dearly love and is still around today. And there's a good shot of Rosich's again, now the public house with that little girl sitting dangerously close to the spittoon. All nationalities needed heroes, and the Slavs in Crested Butte had a man named Peter Zibich, who was from Serbia. In Crested Butte in 1911, he lifted the wheels of a narrow gauge flat car off its track and held on each arm a team of Joe Akers draft horses, pulling his arms together and setting them back on his haunches. Crested Butte also had a great baseball team. Jack Pitzer was a legendary pitcher, played in the minor leagues later on, and always was able to beat Gunnison with Crested Butte collecting bets. Tony Mihalic of Tony's Conoco, now the museum, was also an outstanding player. The immigrants were altered. Frank Arajam was named Orazan by a school teacher. Pete Kuznicic was called Kissimmee Quick by his neighbor. My father's real name was Joseph. But when he came to this country, the Belgians could not pronounce Joseph. They would say Jos. So my dad's name became George. And that was typical of a lot of immigrants who came over here. The Italians were the largest initial group in Crested Butte. 
And there are some of them on the main drag again, dressed up in their fraternal order flags and uniforms. And uh, the Italians, I'll, I'll give a little plug to Rich and Cara Greri, who have written a great book about the Italians in Crested Butte called The Spaghetti Gang. It's great. And they brought with them their customs, traditions, religion, music, and art, philology. All were connected in some way with the minds. Crested Butte, because of the many nationalities, became very cosmopolitan. Very early, there was a lot of trouble, fights, shootings, ostracism between different ethnic groups, much of it concerned women. I'll tell a little personal story here too. When I was a junior in high school, uh, of course, Belgian community, the Finnish people lived not too far away. They were considered lower than the Belgians because they worked in the woods. Why, well, I don't know. And Lucille's a good looking blonde and it was understood that you did not associate with the Finnish people and vice versa. But I got a date with Lucille Lund to the prom. We went to the prom at nine o'clock. You could cut the air with a knife. The tension was so thick. I had Lucille back home about 9.45. My father and mother weren't happy and her father and mother weren't happy. That's the way it was at that time. Mrs. Sarah Allen was born in Crested Butte in 1883. I interviewed her in Grand Junction in 1971. And she remembered when the town was Anglo and then she saw the Southeast Europeans come in. She told me that the Italian women used to bake bread in the Coke ovens on Big Mine Hill and that Anglo kids would gather around and watch. A can of beer would be passed around until finished and another made the round. One Italian family, otherwise as clean as a whistle, kept a cow in the kitchen in the evening. Peter Rollo, an Italian, was involved with a knifing incident in 1900, returned with a gun, and began shooting, wounding one. The Elk Mountain Pilot newspaper declared, quote, the Italians made good citizens after becoming Americanized. Much of the trouble in Crested Butte came as a result of Greek, Black, and other strike breakers coming into town. In 1913, a Greek was shot through the neck by an Italian in Little Italy. He recovered, but when news spread, 25 Greeks came down from Floresta to protect their people. Sheriff Pat Hanlon of Crested Butte came into town, ended the war, which involved a wounded Greek and an elder daughter of an Italian. Mike Welch, half Slavic, started the La Calabria soda water bottling works in 1899 in Crested Butte. It produced cider, soda water, mineral water, root beer, birch beer, and ginger ale. In the year 1970, I interviewed Philip Yaklich, who was then 85. He was born in Slovenia in 1885, later Yugoslavia. He came to the U.S. on a French ship in 1904, went to Pueblo, then Irwin. Before coming to Crested Butte, he worked in the coal mines of Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico. In Crested Butte, he worked in the Buckley, east of town, the Peanut, up the Lower Loop, Smith Hill, up the Anthracite, the Robinson and Pueblo Mines, and also in Floresta. When he worked at the Buckley, he rode a horse a mile to and from work. The miners were paid then on the contract system. You were paid for how much you produced. If you hit rock or a roof fell in, you cleaned it up without pay. Philip told me, idle days. He described the work in the mines as dirty, dangerous, and hard. Yaklich also worked at the great silver mine, the Augusta mine, up Poverty Gulch for a few years. While working at the Buckley, he met the legendary Joe Berta, the man of the mountains, today buried near Baldwin. Berta had been involved in the Ludlow Massacre in 1914, south of Trinidad when the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company had killed 11 women and two children along with miners in breaking a strike by burning their tents. Philip Yaklich's wife's maiden name was Kochever. She was the daughter of Jake Kochever who came to Crested Butte in 1884. She was born 10 years later and her father opened up the peanut mine up the lower loop. She was the first Slovenian child born in Crested Butte. Mrs. Yaklich's mother ran a boarding house for 24 in the early days. 
and many of them, mostly Slavs, stayed home at night to avoid getting beat up. And Mrs. Yaklich got married in 1908. There was a big reception. Twelve Irishmen approached the hall where the reception was and asked if they had been invited. They said no. Mrs. Yaklich said, if you come in, look who's waiting for you. And 50 big Austrians were there. And that was the last weddings that was ever interrupted. There you get a good look at the Crested Butte Town Band made up of immigrants, Elk Avenue, 1900. I've always thought the guy on the left with the tuba looked a lot like John Bellucci in Blues Brothers. The Ku Klux Klan was very big in Crested Butte and in Colorado and in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. They held parades in town. They burned crosses on Chocolate Peak just west of town. The Klan hated Catholics and Jews and blacks and immigrants. And you couldn't be elected uh, to any position. You couldn't even be elected to dog catcher if you weren't a member of the Klan or you weren't supported by the Klan. H.L. Mencken, the great writer for the Baltimore Sun, put it about the Klan perfectly. He said it gave the village idiot a chance to dress up in a white hood and white sheets and engage in hocus pocum. By the end of the 1930s, courageous newspaper editors and, and, and income tax evasion brought the Klan down. But we can't ever rest. Crested Butte had much prejudice early but never any ghettos. There's the Great Rock School built in the early 1880s as one of the first classes there. It was too small to have ghettos. Disease was impartial. Mines were dangerous for all. And time had a way of healing things. It was kind of ironic that by the time the Slavs and other minorities found acceptance, they had become the dominant group in Crested Butte and no longer needed it. One Slavic writer of Crested Butte said, and I quote, the sorrows and struggles, the hopes of the first and the hesitations of the second generation left scarcely any marks on the present third, which by an education, standards, and ambitions can no more be considered Croatian at all, neither by authorities nor by themselves. Now, there's a great friend of mine named Whitey Sporsic on the main drag of Crested Butte. Again, the son of immigrants who came over here. Continuing the quote, having in some cases changed their names for convenience, they are now Americans and nothing else, justifying thus the aims of immigration. I asked my father one time, I said, how come grandpa doesn't go back to Belgium and visit his brothers and sister? And my dad said, because he thinks that if he went back there, a war would break out and he wouldn't be able to get back to the US. That's why they called the area they had come from the old country. They had no desire to go back. They were damn lucky to come to the US. The first and second generations of Crested Butte never developed their full potential. The greatest memorial to these people will always be their work ethic, the fun they had, the strength in the face of hardship and their very neat homes and gardens and their sacrifices for their children to give them what they never had and the other contributions they made to make the U.S. the greatest and most revered nation in the world and Crested Butte one of the most important coal towns in the country. And there's a good shot of uh, Frank Starica at Frank and Gals. And this was taken in the 1970s. We got one more slide. And that is 1980 at the Crested Butte Depot, AMAX, which was trying to put a mine in on Mount Emmons, got all the old timers together and took them on a tour of the town. So that is it on the immigration. We are now going to have a trivia question for a book. And... Remy is going to tell you how to answer, and it's first come, first serve. All right. If you get the trivia question first, you'll post in the chat box, and we'll grab you up. And then if you want to email me at registrar at crestedbuttemuseum.com, I can get your info to Dwayne here, and he'll send you a copy. <laughs> here is the trivia question. 
I want to know the three empires in Europe where most of these immigrants came to Crested Butte, where they came from in Crested Butte. Get the answer for the book. The three empires in Europe where most of the Crested Butte immigrants came from. We're waiting for the answer. Poland, England, Germany. Poland, England, Germany, uh, Mark, uh, not quite right. The three empires, all faded by 1900 because of World War II. Yugoslavia, Slovenia, and Italy, a little closer, but not right. And we're looking for empires now, not individual countries. What were the empires? Anna Thompson, Poland, Belgium, Russia, Austria. There we go. Uh, Dr. James and Mary, Russia, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman Turk. That's it. Uh, Doc, send your uh, address to Remy, and uh, we will get a book sent out to you. Folks, I want to thank everybody for being on board for the eight sessions. It's been wonderful to have you. We'll have uh, another podcast probably coming up in the fall. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, I'll be very happy to attempt to answer. So let me know. You got the chat box. Any comments or questions that you have, please post them. Ray and Jamie, good to have you on board again. Are there any good places to get spring water for drinking around town? Is that where the soda water was coming from? Uh, well, there are two places to get great spring water. One is on the west side of Monarch Pass on the right side of the road as you're coming down. Another one is up Ohio Creek near the Swampy Pass Trail. But the soda water that they got came from Powderhorn. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Uh, yeah, Jim Nelson, thank you very much. Appreciate you being on board. Any more comments or questions, feel free to hop in. Hope to see all of you on board again this fall and we'll have uh, more. Where to buy your books, Mark? Well, the Crested Butte Heritage Museum has all of them. Uh, and they have them in Gunnison at the Bookworm, they have them at Western State, they have them all over the place. Jim, perhaps you covered this in the session I missed. Could you talk about the cattle sheep wars in the country? Uh, yes. The other answer there uh, from Aaron, uh, I, I don't live in Crested Bay, I live in Gunnison. Jim, the cattle sheep wars came as a result of uh, the federal government controlling the 79% of the land they own in the Gunnison country and both sheep and cattlemen wanted it. So wars occurred with the cattlemen engaging in killing a large number of sheep near Iola on the Gunnison River west of town, also killing a bunch of cattle in Taylor Park. And then of course, the one you might be thinking of, uh, it was up around OB Joyful when a forest ranger uh, had a gun put in his stomach, William Kreitzer, and marched around while a group of cattlemen, some of them were drunk, threatened to shoot him, and they killed uh, hundreds of sheep up by Obi Joyful. Now, there's a great book on William Kreitzer called Saga of a Forest Ranger, which gets into that. And William Kreitzer, uh, later on, uh, talked to the cattlemen and said, fellas, uh, we have any more incidents like this. This is now a federal offense, and you're going to jail for 10 years. And ultimately, an informal arrangement was made. Now, it wasn't always uh, total because there were sheep in the Gunnison country and there was even a wool growers association. But the, the dividing line was Cimarron. You could raise sheep west of Cimarron, east of Cimarron, that was cattle country. But there were sheep raised in the Gunnison country, but this is primarily cattle country. Jim, I hope that answers the question. 
Any other questions or comments? Yeah, thank you very much, Tempe. Any other comments or questions, folks, before we uh, get off? Oh, well, I wanted to mention one more thing. Uh, starting on June the 14th, for those of you who get here, I'm going to be giving five day trips. And uh, they will start on June the 14th, Crested Butte area day trips from the museum. June the 14th is going to be Crested Butte and the surrounding area. June the 28th will be Taylor Park. July 12th will be the North Country, like Gothic and Irwin and all the great silver camps. July the 26th will be the Black Canyon. And August the 9th will be the Crested Butte Ski History. We will have transportation. There will be a lunch. We'll probably start off in the morning around 8 o'clock or 8.30 and then uh, get finished around 2. So if you want to find out a little more about this, you just go to the Crested Butte Museum website. Yeah, we'll keep you posted. It'll be coming up on our website and you can sign up there eventually. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. How do we sign up, Tempe? Just go to the museum website and they will have everything on board here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions, ladies and gentlemen? If there aren't any, it has been absolutely wonderful to be on board with all of you. Thank you very much for being on board. Have Anna Bush over and out, and we will see you later. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you, Remy.